excited to be here. I'm thankful to the committee and to Susan for inviting me. Um, I'm going to step out from behind this microphone. Can you hear me? Um, and thanks to all my co-authors on this talk. And there's a lot of them that also substantially contributed to this work and to the work of restoration. I wish I could list the army of folks that were important in this through the years. It's a really huge <coughs> group of people, and it's a face in the light. So when Susan emailed me and asked me to do this talk, she probably gave me a little bit too much lab. She wanted to be connected to the theme, but she also wanted a story about the program. And the Lake Ontario Tech Committee currently is entrenched in reevaluating the program in light of the environmental conditions and drivers and where we're headed in the next 20 years. So I took this as an opportunity to explore that a little deeper and inform my discussions with the tech committee. So I'm going to take you on that trip with me more about lake trout restoration, less about climate change. Thanks. Can you hear me now? So this is going to be a little bit less about climate change, a little bit more about restoration. But my central question in doing this is why do this? And this question grew out of this tension between management for the fishery and native species restoration across the basin. So I'm going to do this by talking about the program and not just the recent program, but going back to its roots. Uh, talking about what we've learned and the pitfalls of the program, how they're currently doing in the lake, uh, and then trying to recalibrate um, my thoughts and the thoughts of the committee on go the way forwards in light of the environmental conditions that currently are and the ones we're facing uh, in a system that's going to be also greatly impacted by climate change. Of course, I hit the wrong So. This is the obligatory map. There's Lake Ontario, where the easternmost uh, downstream Great Lake, um, the smallest of the Great Lakes, but um, we still are a very large lake, so we got that going for us. And we're a very deep lake, and we're a very cold lake. Uh, a lot of it's uh, exceptional lake trout habitat. Uh, and, and its position in the Great Lakes, proximity to the Atlantic coast, has given it a long history of uh, colonization and subsequent uh, effects by people. And by the 1800s, it was fully colonized, uh, and the shoreline had really a lot of da damage in terms of um, blocking streams for mills and clearing the land. Um, and that resulted by the end of the 1800s in the first major extirpation of this really uh, exciting population of Atlantic salmon that were out there on the landscape at that time. Super abundant, exciting population. Um, they were, all intents and purposes, gone by the turn of the century. Uh, the other thing it did is there needed to be transport for all these products that were being um, produced in the region at the time, and canals were the uh, theme of the day, and not only did they allow goods and services to travel, they allowed invasive species to travel, and we got alewives, and we got sea lamprey presumably through those canals, and both of those animals would be important players in how the system fared subsequent to that. By the 1950s and 60s, it was a doom and gloom story, uh, demise of many of the native species on the horizon, uh, alewife and sea lamprey figured into that, I'll talk a little bit about that, and lake trout certainly figured into that as well. By the 1970s, a real seminal event in the Great Lakes, we got sea lamprey control. Following sea lamprey control, we started the third attempt at lake trout restoration in Lake Ontario, which is the important uh, backstory of what I'm going to talk about. It's actually the third attempt at this. Uh, and along with stocking lake trout and following on the upper lakes, successes, uh, trout and salmon were stopped here. There was a complex of six spe species going into the lake, and by the 1980s, it created this really exciting economic driver of the fishery, and that, that fishery would prove to be, in my opinion, an overwhelming uh, force that bounded what management could do in the lake. We're um, back now. So you can't talk about the history of Lake Ontario without showing a graph like this. These are the commercial catch statistics. Uh, the, the red is the Canadian catch. The blue is the, uh, the New York side. If you can see it, it's pretty much gone. The lake trout catch is pretty much gone by the time the records were being caught, kept. Um, <clears throat> if you corrected this catch for effort, uh, that 1920s rise in catches is all driven by an intensification of effort. It's not an increase in the population. That population was undergoing a long period of decline until their extirpation in the 1950s. Little 
flip it around. There you go. Yeah. So, there we go. I added this in, and this is just to make an important point. So this is the uh, catch in the sport fishery today in the 1980s and 1990s, and the peak of this catch rivaled the catches that were going on in the commercial fishery at the demise of the native population. So that's going to be an important impact to deal with. <clears throat> so the question remains in my mind, uh, why do this? Why, why go back and try Lake Trout again? Or why were they actually, I can't see this right back here. I, I'd argue, and I think other folks would argue as well, that um, their life history makes them vulnerable. They spawn late, they don't spawn every year. And they're relatively low in fecundity. They need um, specific habitat to put their eggs into, clean cobble that's in short supply in some areas. Um, and those eggs undergo a long period of incubation where they're susceptible to all kinds of uh, disturbance. The newly hatched larvae then in the springtime have to come out of the gravel and swim to the surface to inflate their swim bladders, and that subjects them to a rather perilous journey through a bunch of larval predators. It's widely accepted that the commercial fishery was, was the primary driver in reducing the lake trout population in the 1920s and then allowing sea lamprey to come in in the one-two punch to finish them off. The commercial fishery was prosecuted on the spawning shoals, it was a size selected fishery, and the biggest fishery would first. Uh, and it's thought also that the declining hosts for sea lamprey, and sea lamprey where abundance was increasing in the lake, turned the behavior of sea lamprey from parasitism to predation, where the hosts were surviving in the past, but now they were dying. Um, and that, that release of predatory control then allowed uh, non-native alewives and rainbow smelt to proliferate in the lake, and that was happening at the same time that the native lake trout prey was now being uh, hit really hard by that same commercial fishery that prior to that was concentrating on lake trout. And that led to the demise of most of the uh, deep water strains of, of rigglings in the lake and really pushed back uh, the shallow water strain. I wanted to throw an uh, interesting picture in because I like historical pictures. Um, the, federal the federal hatchery system became involved in this quite early on. For those with you of you who are familiar with, uh, with the area up around Cape Vincent, you might recognize that place. That is uh, Cape Vincent, New York State DEC uh, Fisheries Research Station. In a former life, it was a federal hatchery established in 1895 and, and working up into the early 1960s. One of their primary um, jobs right out, of the, right out of the gate was lake trout restoration, trying to put fish in to enhance the commercial fishery. And when I went back and looked at the records from the hatchery that were published in, in this uh, L. Rod et al. paper in the 95 Restore volume, two things struck me by this. One, that this program was as long as the current restoration program. There's over 50 years of stocking this. And the intensity of stocking was quite high early on. Those declines in the later end of it aren't due to a lack of interest, they're due to a lack of adults producing eggs out in the wild stock. And the other thing that struck me about this is those fish were going into a lake back in the late 1800s that was still conducive to natural reproduction by lake trout. Yet when, lake trout, when Elrod and others looked at this history, they found no relationship between the stocking and the population of the lake. So these were all failing, despite the fact that it was still amenable to fry production. So that's the first lesson from the history. So in the 1960s, when the, the feds pulled out and the state took over the hatchery, the state and OMNR wanted to continue this program. And they continued stocking, but um, with ideas from inland stockings and the upper lakes, they targeted later life stages fingerlings, small fingerlings, and spring yearlings. And they got, uh, with the help of federal hatcheries in the upper Great Lakes, they got quite high numbers going in just into the eastern end of the lake. And they found, unlike those fry stockings, these fish did quite well. They survived quite well up to about an age of age three, about a size of about 450 millimeters. That's right when they're becoming vulnerable to the sea lampreys and the commercial whitefish fishery, and that basically was a one-two punch. They never saw any fish holding them. So that's the second um, second lesson that came out of this, for me, was um, the intensity of the sea lamp predation and the whitefish fishery were two things that were gonna need to be controlled and stayed on top of. And the, 
I wanted to throw in my obligatory slide paying homage to the father of sea lamprey control in the Great Lakes. This picture of Vernon Applegate. Really a watershed moment in the management of all the Great Lakes. This ushered in the modern era of ecosystem restoration when Vern was able to take TFM, a nitrophenol, it's a selective larvicide, out of the laboratory, bring it into the trips of Lake Superior, and really effectively knock out larval sea lamprey. And that quickly uh, steamrolled into the program that we now have today. It was brought right out into the field at control levels. And um, we got that control quite a bit later. Uh, 1971 on the Canadian side of Lake Ontario, 1972 on the U.S. side of the lake. Um, at the time, there were 57 tributaries that were producing sea lamprey. So this was a tremendous effort in Lake Ontario and a really expensive effort. And it's no surprise that it took over 15 years to bring the population under control. And it took a little bit extra time than what you would see. This is adult abundance through time. It looks like it's coming into control here, but lake trout mortality did not go down until the late 1980s. <clears throat> so why do it again? Why enter into this modern era of restoration? Well, from the literature, they're still recognized as an historically important native species. They were one of the highest valued species and one of the most abundant species in the prior commercial catches. The prospect of the fishery, the Lake Mission example, for Lake Ontario was a, was a, a big, um, interesting event that we could bring to Lake Ontario. Lake Michigan turned alewives into a productive fishery, and we wanted that here as well. And then those successes of those early stockings with uh, older life stages, and they crystallized this in the 1983 plan by saying it was time. Water quality had improved enough. Sea lamprey control was here, and, and really important, too importantly, lake trout were available in federal hatcheries. These are big places to do restoration. So the strategies from the 83 plan was to stock a lot of the appropriate life stages. The target was two and a half million, but to continue vigilant sea lamprey control. And it's an ongoing, really labor-intensive, really expensive process. And then also to get a hold of the sport fishery. And I showed you earlier what that sport fishery harvest could look like when it went unchecked. Uh, and then also <coughs> to start looking for um, ways to maximize reproductive potential of the stock. Because up until this time, the stock wasn't aging. And of course, um, follow adaptive management principles. And if all else fails, the stock doesn't reproduce. Look elsewhere at an early life history of lake trout for the answers. <coughs> So this colorful graph, um, the colors really denote the genetic diversity. So that underpinned the programs across all the Great Lakes. These are supposed to be experimental programs that mine the landscape for as much genetic diversity as possible to restore these things. Um, and that happened in Lake Ontario to the extent possible. Uh, a couple things to be aware of here. This, this um, huge increase in stocking um, really was brought about by the federal hatcheries coming online. And, and starting to stock the lakes. We hit target, stayed at target um, for a number of years here. Um, this big decrease is a stocking cut that I'll talk about to uh, diminish productivity in the lake. It'll become important when you look at the adult stock down the road and the tools we currently have to do lake trout restoration. Uh, a little bit scarier out here, and, and the reason why we're trying to recalibrate our thinking today, the system is changing again, and stocking cuts are occurring. So uh, one of my co-authors is out here in the water, and uh, she took, her and Chuck Kruger took um, seriously the 1983 plan saying let's go look for lake trout restoration, lake trout natural reproduction, and they wanted to go swimming in the fall in Lake Ontario, it's a little bit nuts, but uh, good for them. Um, and they picked a great spot, they went up here to Stony Island in the eastern end of the lake, an area of known historical spawning habitat, and just prior to that, the agency DEC was out doing assessment netting on that shoal and was finding pretty good aggregations of fish and spawning condition there. So when Ellen got in the water, she found three real, really critical things. One, there was good spawning habitat there, so there still was intact spawning habitat. Two, she was measuring good rates of egg deposition on, on that shoal. And probably the most important for the program and the energy that we're collecting the program going forward is she found um, successfully reproduced lake trout larvae. Prior to this, in all the assessment fishing that was going on at the time, 
one larvae had been caught in 1982. So by 1986, they were seeing signs of great reproduction. But looming in the background, this is a too close to my head here, um, was this issue of early mortality syndrome. A lot of you guys are probably familiar with that. It was called swim up syndrome at the time that Simons went out and started diving on Shawn Spawning Shoals at the same time Ellen was out there. And he was seeing egg deposition and he was seeing swim up fry and he was bringing those eggs back to the lab and hatching them out. And he found that 30 to 70 percent of all the fertilized eggs were dying at hatch out due to the swim up syndrome. So the swim up syndrome, the fish hatch out, they get erratic, um, they get lethargic, and they quickly die. So this was a pretty severe impediment. So this is all going on in the background, um, but at the time, things look pretty good in the adult stock. So this um, fairly complicated graph, the green is the adult numbers. So this is the impact of sea lamprey control and of intensified stocking. Uh, we hit a plateau about 1986 where we had a pretty stable abundance of stock for a long period of time. But uh, Ellen saw those fry showing up in 1986. Sorry, it's kind of frustrating. Um, but we weren't seeing any recruitment of those fry beyond beyond that swim up stage to be such a that. That didn't come until 1993. And what was going on in the background, there were two things, but the one thing that uh, severe control um, kind of fixed was the population wasn't aging out there. Sea lamprey were under control by this time but lake trout still weren't surviving past the age of first reproduction in the stock. It took some severe harvest restrictions. Managers went to war for lake trout. They took a lot of flack for this. About 100,000, upwards of 10% of the stock was being harvested per year. And they put in severe harvest restrictions, responded to some of the bad press they were getting, uh, lessened those up, and then put them in place again in 1992. And this is how the population responded to those, directly responded to those. So this is. This black line is the number of mature females, females 87 and older in the stock. And after that, it quickly aged, and we, we got a stock where 70% of the adult fish were in this reproductive range. And quickly after that, we started to see recruitment of naturally reproduced fish in the lake. Here's the first two year classes caught in 1995 down in the western end of the lake. Um, but this was just a trickle. We weren't seeing that steamroller that we were hoping for. And this is this idea of EMS. So another important event occurred in the mid-1990s. Fitzsimons and a whole group of others were working on the root cause of the swim-up syndrome. And they tied thymine deficiencies in the eggs to the, the mortality that was going on at the time. They'd go on, the group would go on and do other studies and strongly tie this thymine deficiency to a maternal diet that was rich in alewives. Lake trout diet is about 70% or more alewives in Lake Ontario. A predator that eats an alewife quickly loses the thymine of that entire meal when the thymidase, the enzyme that destroys thymine that's in the gut of the alewife, is released on digestion. So you don't only lose the vitamin B from the alewives that are in your stomach, you also lose it from the gobies and whatever else. Then this was all going on and in the background the water quality agreement was beginning to do fundamental changes in the lake, pushing it from mesotrophy to oligotrophy. Those changes really played out in the 80s and 90s, thanks to my co-author Dr. Whitehell for putting this together to me. But one thing I'm not showing you is his relationship between declining nutrients, a really strong relationship be between the declining prey stock and most notably alewives. They really underpin the trout and salmon complex in the lake. All of those fish eat a lot of alewives. Um, the other thing that was going on in the background that was really interesting is the lakes were clearing up. And it wasn't just due to this nutrient uh, reduction in the lake. We also had dry sea mussels coming in, filtering productivity that was still there in the water column and putting it down on the bottom of the lake, so essentially replumbing the lake. <clears throat> so responding to that, the management bodies convened an international board of scientists and assessment biologists and managers to look at the issue. And they um, decided that it was time to cut lake trout with the information from the upper lakes, uh, especially Lake Michigan, that had just undergone a similar problem and 
when they let it go, the ocean of salmon fat, uh, fishery pretty much collapsed for a while. So in 1993, really unpropular. I showed you in that earlier graph, basically a 50% reduction in Chinook salmon and lake trout. It played across the landscape of the papers and the media, and uh, the managers um, really took some hits for this. But this set up this idea of tension. So this, this idea of tension between the fishery and native species restoration was being talked about across the basin. It was crystallized uh, by the statement in the 1990 fish community objectives for Lake Ontario, wherein the Lake Ontario Committee accepted that the current environment, um, that it's stakeholder driven, um, is to manage for Chinook salmon and alewives. And by doing that, you impede restoration of native species, lake trout are hit in two fronts, larval predation and the stymie decision. Um, but that's not to say that I'm in the camp that thinks Chinook salmon are bad. I'm not. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why this is a dominant force in the management today. One is this economic driver, hugely important. That's just today's shoreside expenditures by anglers, $64 million. And if you've driven through the Rust Belt of New York State, you can envision how important that dollar figure is to the folks that live there. <clears throat> the other one is, this is a terrific fishery. And in a lot of ways, these guys replace the Atlantic salmon that were out there. This is a really exciting draw to Lake Ontario. And in my opinion, and I think a lot of others would agree with this, there's no better tool in the Great Lakes for lake trout restoration than Chinook salmon. Steve Lepan's out here, he's heard this from me, stock more salmon. <laughs> <laughs> so that tension is set up, and that's recognized. The declining nutrients are recognized. It's time to change the plans. In 1997, we had a revision of that plan with a new strategy recognizing that lowered nutrient status in the lakes and also embracing those observations, low observations of uh, natural recruitment that was going on that was making this program, despite the fact that it had been going on for a long time, and there were two um, prior iterations of it, making this program look possible. So they were embracing those things, they embraced those stocking cuts, so you're cutting the fuel in half to drive this engine in the lake. But uh, it was embraced and it's still going on, that's still the target. Um, but also recognizing that uh, adult mortality is a real problem with lake trout restoration. That has to uh, be kept under control. It requires vigilant uh, sea lamprey control to control the fishery. And the focus shifted from the adults to the early life history impediments. And one of the prior things here was prey, prey fish community uh, rehabilitation. Deep water sculpting at the time were starting to show up again. So that looked to be going on by itself. Uh, but the Lake Ontario Committee embraced uh, Corrigating re Restoration, and there is an ongoing program now, the first in the Great Lakes. A lot of it's coming out of our, our lab at Tunis and Jim McKenna's shop to rehabilitate deep water ciscos in the Great Lakes. We're currently stocking deep water ciscos. That's pretty important in how we go forwards with reframing the approach to lake trout restoration. Still more changes, though. Every time you think you got a handle on this, something changes. And like I said earlier, the system was replumbed by dry seated mussels in the 1990s, and they really set the stage for this ballast water exotic coming in in the mid 2000s. Um, 